Hello everyone, I'm Elise Cavero. Let's talk about what is going on in the tech world so far in 2024. For that, I am back with two powerhouses, two familiar faces, globally recognized networking and security analyst Will Townsend and world-renowned cybersecurity expert Ralph Echemendia, aka The Ethical Hacker. Guys, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here today. It's great to be here. Elise. Always, to see always you. great to be here, Elise, and always yeah. it will. You know, always good to see you too. Yeah, likewise, my friend. Exactly. So then, let's get right into it. I recently wrote an article on Amazon's AWS record-breaking infrastructure investment in Europe. I mean, their investment is a monumental 15.7 billion euros allocated to develop a new AWS region with the main base in Saragossa, Spain. So, Will, this one first is for you. Um, yeah. The recent announcement shows that Europe is becoming an even bigger hub for technology, placing Spain at the forefront of technology, innovation, and even artificial intelligence in Europe. So what are your thoughts on what this means for other big tech giants? I mean, will they follow suit to establish themselves more in Europe? Why do you think AWS has made this move? Well, Elise, it's a great question. And so number one, it's about data sovereignty. So, and, and obviously Europe is on the leading forefront of privacy and GDPR and, and all of that. So what the public cloud providers are doing is they're basically deploying points of presence all over the world, especially in Europe, um, to maintain that data sovereignty. So the, the whole notion of data that gets processed in the cloud needs to stay within the region. So that, that's number one, very, very important for the European Union. Um, number two, points of presence are always a good thing. So as these public cloud providers expand their points of presence, that just gives them more elasticity, more compute, more storage to provide the necessary services to, uh, to customers as well. But you know, finally, I'll end on a point around Spain. It's no secret that Spain has become a hotbed of technology. It hosts the Mobile World Congress Barcelona event every year. And we're beginning to see uh, some homegrown companies like uh, Satelliet that is doing low earth orbit satellite connectivity for, for IoT solutions. And I've, I've met with the CEO on a couple of different occasions, both at the event and, and outside of the event as well. But um, it really highlights Spain's importance and on the world stage with respect to technology. But Sort of at a high level, that's my take on it. Absolutely. Thank you, Will. So now over yeah. to yourself. AWS also announced that it will expand its cloud infrastructure in the Aragon region with the support of regional governments. They have already been made uh, many announcements. Uh, and just like Will said, many new companies are coming up. And now even Telefonica and other top names are already using these AWA facilities. With your experience, Ralph, using and recruiting top talent in Europe, what opportunities does this open for young cybersecurity talent, uh, not just in Spain, but for the whole of Europe? Oh, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, it, 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 uh, I think we're going to find that it's going to open, you know, many, many new um, companies within the region as well, right, within cybersecurity. Um and uh, the, you know, it's it's important to think and realize that you're not just dealing with Spain, right? Uh, like you said, this is Europe, and there's so much good talent out there, so much good young talent. A, a big factor of that is also that, to a large degree, I think the educational system is, I'd, I'd say, better than it is in the, in the states when it comes to young talent uh, getting access to it. The means to be working on things they, they actually like and love, right? Um, it's just quite different. So you go to, you know, as you know, I've spent a lot of time in Estonia, had a company there, and it was pretty amazing to see that, you know, they'd have a, a hackathon. Uh, and I think we did an event way back. I think it was, in fact, it was in uh, North Macedonia now, where, you know, you had 12-year-old kids and 9-year-old kids, you know, in and groups participating in a hackathon 
And that's not <laughs> something that we see that often, uh, right? Uh, for example, in the US. So it really opens the doors to a lot of people more focused to in cybersecurity, which is an area that is uh, going to continue to be an issue, right? As far as the numbers involved of, of the, I think uh, the, one of the last articles I, I recently read said it was something like two or three million positions, jobs, openings that, that, that exist in cybersecurity on a global basis that go unfilled, yeah. right? So yeah. I think it's a huge opportunity for, for not just Spain, but Europe as a whole. That yeah, I, you know, I would agree with Ralph, you know, at least from, from the United States standpoint, we're, we're certainly behind um, getting to youth uh, at a much earlier age, although we're beginning to see some programs that are, that are coming along. Um, there is a focus at sort of the collegiate level uh, to develop not only um, cybersecurity curriculum and degrees, but also certificates. So for people that um, want to enter um, a cybersecurity uh, employment opportunity, there are, you know, one-year certificates from accredited colleges. Uh, and then there's also a lot of private-public collaboration going on. As an example, in the U.S., uh, former military uh, members are, are prime candidates for cybersecurity jobs because it really plays into their, their DNA and, and, and their desire and, um, and you're seeing companies like Arctic Wolf that, that operate a SOC in San Antonio, um, recruiting from the various bases within San Antonio, Texas for, for cyber talent. So yeah, you know, and the number Ralph that you mentioned, I mean, that, that matches with, with my understanding as well. We can't fill these positions, you know, quickly enough. And I tell you what, with generative AI, um, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, certainly, it's going to uh, suit defenders. And like, I spent time recently at RSA conference with with Microsoft, their security team, talking about their Copilot for security solution, what it's doing to help rapidly onboard SOC analysts, as well as generate situational reports that can be shared uh, throughout the organization. But bad actors can use generative AI to become even more sophisticated. And so, it's this constant battle. And we've got to bring more more reinforcements from the ranks, and certainly Europe is a leader in that in, in that regard. And and I'm hoping that you know that we focus on on programs to hit youth at those early ages, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, um, to groom them for uh, for future cybersecurity positions. Great points by both of you. And uh, Ralph, I do remember that event that we went to. It was actually yeah, 2017. It was called Code Fest. And I was so shocked that these kids were just, they were so tiny. And if we can just bring this together, like with Will, what you said, if this is a cross country kind of thing that companies need to do, it's not whether the US is better, whether Europe is better, it's bringing everyone together, bringing the talent from the different countries and just making the best of everything. And Will, because you touch on AI, let's go on to my next question, moving into yeah new era of um, AI that, as I often say, is moving so fast that it's really hard uh, to keep up with. And the last video that we made, Will, uh, we spoke about AI. Since then, many announcements have been made. Um, a really cool one recently, literally a couple of days ago, was about NTT and Indy 500, because yeah. NTT used the event to show off its R&D, its cutting edge technologies, okay. and it has pushed the boundaries of how technology can now impact motorsports. And since I know that you're very familiar with NTT, what can you tell us about how NTT is elevating the tech game this year? Well, you know, it's 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 a great question, and I've spent a lot of time with NTT recently. I had an opportunity to to, to travel to Tokyo last November and attend uh, the NTT R and D forum, and um, and then just recently in San Francisco, they do an annual event called Upgrade, and and that's sponsored through the um, the NTT Americas division that's based in Sunnyvale, California. And, you know, as I've gotten to know the company, they're, they're one of the best kept secrets from my perspective, you know, the Pond Telephone and Telegraph, NTT, I mean, one of the largest uh, publicly traded companies in, in Japan. 
And they do a lot. Um, they do a lot of integration work with companies like Cisco, but they also have capabilities um, in cloud. Um, you know, they're growing out in AI with what they're doing with uh, their own version of the large language model and private networking. So um, with the Indianapolis 500, you know, there's a lot of connectivity needs, right? So there's telemetry that's coming off the vehicles that needs to be shared with pit crews and, and that sort of thing. And so a private 5G network plays really well, you know, given the fiber-like throughput and, and extreme low latency uh, that, that it provides. And in fact, um, Cisco has been involved with the Indy Autonomous Challenge, which, which actually, these are youth. And I, and I attended an event a couple of years ago in Dallas, Texas, where they were using, you know, cellular technology and, and AI to pull telemetry off these vehicles and actually autonomously pilot these vehicles as well. But, but getting back to NTT, um, you know, private networking is a big component of it and certainly artificial intelligence. So when you think about, um, you know, race cars in general, and, and this would apply to, to F1 and, and NASCAR and Indy, um, these vehicles are basically mobile computers. They have hundreds, if not thousands of IoT sensors and, and, and computers and, and that sort of thing that need to be monitored. And so, you know, where AI comes into play is, you know, using that, that 5G connectivity with, with IoT to do predictive analysis to determine, hey, is a tire going to wear, you know, sooner? Could there be a malfunction with the engine and that sort of thing? So um, these sorts of use cases within racing events are, are a great highlight for the power of bringing connectivity and, um, you know, and telemetry together with AI to drive better outcomes and better predictability. And at the end of the day, it's about winning races. So anything that, that you can lean into to win races is, is a good thing. Absolutely, Will. And this brings me a follow-up to you, Ralph, because we're talking about AI and what NTT has done, for example. But then what impact have you seen so far this year when it comes to cybersecurity? Because we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence and all these uh, new sports and everything that it can do for us. But has the rise of artificial intelligence made it easier for hacks to happen? Well, that's a great question, Elise, um, because I think, at least from my experience thus far in cybersecurity, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you have to keep in mind that security in general, or cybersecurity, um, has, exists because of insecurity. <laughs> so the first place that te the, the technology is, is used, or the first way that technology tends to be used, tends to be in the insecurity first. And... So, uh, yes, I've seen AI make it a lot easier for hackers to hack people, right? It's not so much that the AI is really being, uh, you know, incredibly helpful in finding uh, bugs in, in, the, in, the, in that sense. It's more that it's being used as a weapon, as, as a lot of technology often is, to automate, really. And, and you've heard me play around with that it's not AI, it's IA, it's just further automation. It's it's mm -hmm. intelligent automation. Um, but that's what it is. It's now making it a lot easier. I mean, uh, and I think I've, you've seen this in the past where I've used this chart to show the level of knowledge that someone had to have in the 1980s and the late 80s to accomplish what would be technically a pretty simple hack, right? And it was, you know, this way, right? So the knowledge had to be really high and the, the actual complexity of that type of attack would be really low. And over the years, it's just gone the other way, right? So now we have, you know, much more complexity to the attack or to the technologies, but the knowledge base required to execute those attacks is much lower thanks to tools like AI, right? So they are being used primarily first to, uh, uh, mostly scam people right now. It's really good in creating all kinds of different attacks that, that use email and messaging and all the, all these different ways to be able to get people to trust the technology uh, or the communications they're having. So um, from the from the other aspect of it, from the defense side of it, um, it really, uh, I mean, it's helpful. 
in uh, analyzing data because that's the thing is we're dealing with a lot of data and this certainly helps for things like SOX, the security operation centers, to be able to identify uh, behavioral uh, anomalies in, in, in data and traffic and access better. Um, but again, as, as, as it has been for a very long time, it, it, it's a lot more effective by the bad guys these days. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I think identity, you know, Ralph, you touched on that, you know, deep fakes and, and that sort of thing. Identity is becoming the new hack. And I think where generative AI is aiding um, bad actors is around um, using it as an example to grammatically create better phishing emails, mm -hmm. right? We, we all laugh yep. at the broken English that, that we get from, you know, Nigeria or from Russia yep. or wherever it's coming from. So I think that's helping. It's to your point, it's automating uh, phishing and spear phishing attacks as well at much, much higher uh, volumes. But, you know, when, when you look, I'll, I'll, I'll cite an example. Um, the most recent uh, big news around MGM and, and what happened there where um, it was a mm -hmm. ransomware attack that that crippled the entire company and not just in Las Vegas, but but worldwide. And um, basically, you know, people's room keys couldn't function, elevators couldn't function, reservation desks couldn't take reservations. It completely cratered the operation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and guess how the bad actor gained lateral movement across that network? It was an identity hack. So. I think that, you know, I don't want to provide fuel to, to any bad actors that might be tuning into this, you know, this podcast, but, but um, defenders are going to have to get, you know, much more sophisticated. And, I, and again, I, I get back to the notion that generative AI can be a double-edged sword. And, you know, I cite Microsoft as a great example, Copilot for Security. It's, it's in its fledgling stage. It just went GA this year. Um, but, you know, given the gold rush around next generation AI, and all the investment that's being poured into silicon. I mean, just look at NVIDIA's rocket ship earnings. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. They they hit a record over eleven hundred dollars for the first time in their history on their stock price. Um, so people are serious about this. Uh, there are there are challenges and concerns around power consumption that need to be addressed. But um, yeah, we we're living in really really interesting times for sure. Interesting and Indeed. also scary <laughs> because um... yeah. And yeah. we have uh, Will Townsend, analyst. He knows everything there is to know behind the scenes. Then on the other side, we have Ralph Timendia, ethical hacker, who, again, just knows more than he will be ever be able to talk about. He will take a lot of things to the grave. Um, and just analyzing what you guys say, it can become scary. But also the reason why we need to continue doing this content, why we need to bring awareness to companies, to individuals about the importance of security. And this is what brings me to my last question today. And this one is inspired, um, it's a little bit controversial because it's inspired by the recent Ashley Madison documentary on Netflix, which was released on uh, May 15th. And although it has a lot of mixed reviews due to the topic, um, of course, it has made everyone more aware again of the data bridges and how easy it is if you don't have the right security. During the documentary, you guys, there is a sentence, because I'm not sure if you both have seen it, but there is a sentence by one of the guys who says, the promise of security and anonymity and guarantee and safety was something we said, it wasn't something we did. Unfortunately, right. not shocking for me, or I'm even sure not shocking for you guys, because this is something mm -hmm. not new to this day. Many companies do the same. So, Will, I'm going to start with you. Based on this, from an analyst point of view, why do you think some companies, just like Austin Madison, which, by the way, is still operational and still has millions of users, why do they still wait for something to happen before taking action and either implementing security measures or making them a priority? We seem to come back to this question over the years. What are your thoughts? Ralph? Yeah, I mean, I think Ralph um, said it well that inherently networks are insecure and there, there's always gonna be a soft spot that can be um, exploited. 
but you know, there's also this this whole challenge of security hygiene, and this is a, a pretty alarming statistic. But you know, in in my research, um, I found that, and and Ralph, I'd like to get your 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 thoughts on this if if I'm if I'm on base or off base. But over thirty percent of companies don't even employ multi-factor authentication. Is that something that syncs up with with your understanding, Ralph? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's crazy. I think that number yeah. is even higher. It, it, you yeah. Know. Um, but yeah, it is crazy, and it's something we've had for a very long time, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But no, that uh, it, 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 there's there's so many different aspects to the word security, right? Um, uh, as far as you know, well, there's technology tools, of course, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a number of different technology tools that you would have to implement um but it, it, it's a matter of really to i think largely goes back to the issue of uh of scarcity of resources and i don't mean right. just the money i think yeah. there's uh especially when it comes to uh upper level management and leadership when it comes to security and communicating what that really means to a company right it means something very different to say a hospital than a company that sells shoes right um yeah. Uh, risk is 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 not entirely understood, uh, and and that's why you see, for example, in banking, they're very strong, right? Because they understand yeah. risks. They work with risk very well, and everything's stored in a computer, so they tend to spend not only more money, um, but also get the right resources to truly understand the business that they're in, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's that's the big problem with a lot of organizations and especially small and medium businesses who have no capabilities really other than you know through some managed service provider um yeah. and they have to trust right they have to trust in these people and that they have the resources to do it right um so i think it really boils down to that um i think uh and maybe you you recall this well but there was um something that was i think last year was uh, put forth by the u.s government saying that publicly traded companies were going to have to have somebody on the board of directors that was a cybersecurity expert, right? right? That had yeah. a cybersecurity yeah. expertise on the board of directors yeah. of the business, right. which, uh, which goes to my point, which is these are business people with an understanding of what cybersecurity means to the business, right? To specifically yeah. to that business, right? As opposed to cybersecurity as a whole in general. Um, yeah. Because it really comes down to uh, a matter of safety in their operations, reducing risk, not only for themselves, but for their clientele, and so yeah. on and so forth. And and that's an area where we really lack the resources, really lack the human beings to truly understand it. Yeah. It's not like you can just take an engineer uh, or mm -hmm. a developer straight out of the cybersecurity world and then put them into a boardroom and say, hey, <laughs> explain right. to me what, what this means. Uh, it's going to exactly. be like a whole other language right so uh, it trans that translating that and, and that sort of that, that middle ground between the technology and the management of a company and understanding of the business uh it, it, that's a real hard one i mean there's no classes for that you know that's exactly. that right now you know it's like okay you can go learn programming you can go learn network security you can go learn you know application security uh you can go learn business but how many people do you know that really have done that and have the experience on both sides of that. Uh, yeah. Not many. And that makes it really difficult for these companies to have the right, um, again, leadership at that level when it comes to what they're doing with cybersecurity. So, you know, every one of these breaches, Ashley Madison too, uh, I think that what you said that this person said on the uh, documentary is very, everyone would say that, right? Everyone, yeah. I think in the business world would say, yeah, we say that and we have policies we have written it down but how well we actually implement that is to will's point of that 30 percent of companies you know don't use multi-factor authentication and it's more than that from my perspective i mean security has got to be a team sport and you've got to involve all the stakeholders to, to the point that you, you you made very well ralph so you know legal hr net ops sec ops the bod the ceo they all of these people need to be knowledgeable about what's going on. And, and what I wrote about in, in my Forbes article 
that wrapped up RSA conference was around initiatives um, that are focused on embedding security as a priority in the product development process. So Microsoft um, has an initiative called Secure Futures, where they're actually going to install deputy CISOs within every product line within the company, not just Microsoft security, but think about mm. Office 365, think about Teams, think about um, everything that they do for, to drive accountability. And, you know, and also they're tying executive leadership compensation to security. And the priority is designing for security first and features second. And, and that's a big sea change. And what that's also driven is Secure by Design, which is a, which is a, an initiative I think that was born in the U.S. And I'm forgetting the agency that that's behind that. But at RSA Fortinet, a company that uh, is founded by two Chinese national brothers, and has been had has had a, a target painted on 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 the company's back because of the CEO's origin, um, birth origin. Um, they're the, they were one of the first companies to step up to sign up for um, Secure by Design, which mimics and mirrors what, what Microsoft is doing. So I'm encouraged to see that big tech is taking the right steps to, to make security a priority within the product development process, tying compensation to it as well, uh, because what, what's occurred in the past isn't working. And, and also, by the way, I think one of the biggest challenges that, that are faced by many organizations is just uh, security tool sprawl. And, you know, the average, you know, mid-market sized organization typically is managing 80 or 90 different point solutions. And so the trend that I'm seeing is, you know, companies reassessing that, the swivel chair management that's associated with that, the gaps that are created by that, and consolidating from a best of breed approach to a more, you know, sort of, you know, smaller footprint where, and I don't think, you know, one company is going to, you know, deliver all the security tools necessary for an organization, mm -hmm. mid-market or large enterprise. But if you can reduce that number from 100 or 80 down to uh, a dozen, that's, that's a big deal. I mean, what do you think about that, Ralph? No, that's absolutely true. I mean, that's one of the biggest problems is you walk into any, Anyone, especially large organizations, it's, it's even a bigger, uh, you know, the, the number of tools being used, right, um, yeah. is, is it complicates things. Already, as you know, Will, I mean, if you have Cisco routers and you have, you know, some other type of switches and you have some other type of, you, you know, even though there has been some standardization of some protocols, the tool sets are, are quite different, right, to get what you're yeah. trying to achieve the outcome so uh yeah just the i mean the sheer number of technologies in use um when you look at the number of components in those technologies right within any organization guarantees that every organization can be hacked that just guarantees oh, yeah. it by complexity yeah i mean just the api level calls right i mean th those are typically unmonitored and that creates a porous nature when you try to stitch all of these to your point security and networking tools together. I mean, the good thing is, you know, we are seeing a convergence of security and networking when you look at SD-WAN and, and SASE and, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And certainly integrating security into the networking fabric is better from an outcome and, um, and management perspective. But um, there, there's just so many moving parts to your point and you've got legacy, you've got modern architecture. These things don't talk to one another. You got to piece them together. It's usually via an API call, and that creates vulnerability. So, I mean, at least that that's a long way, I think, for Ralph and I to <laughs> to answer oh, your yeah, question. Yeah. But, oh yeah, well, yeah. And, and listen, yeah. amazing. To, to 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 actually with something that Will started uh, on on that on that issue, and to kind of you know kind of end it there is, and don't forget the janitor. OK, yeah. this is not an issue that is just about the technology. Right. This right. is a very physical issue that we sometimes think is only a virtual issue, but it's not. And, yeah. you know, that really it's a matter of making, you know, and I think security is a, is a strong word. That's why I tend to want to use safety and that security is a component of safety, because it's really about creating that culture within the company where the 
janitor feels just as good, not as bothered by the issue of security, but just feels just as valuable to the securing of, of their community, if you will, their environment, mm -hmm. their company. And it, it's yeah. a real cultural issue that we haven't, we haven't really properly addressed, right? It's sort of like when, you know, NASA had a space shuttle blow up, the issue of safety became a cultural issue within NASA, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's one that definitely helped when it became a cultural issue, not just an operational one. Love this. Great point. Question. Exactly. You ask, ask the rest questions and let the experts share their knowledge for the next five. <laughs> Literally, this question <laughs> can become its own podcast. Now, I have just one more thought on this, and we're going to go from companies to individuals. And this is more to you, Ralph. With your behind the scenes experience with celebrities, high net worth individuals, and governments, I want to highlight, just like you both now have about companies, I want to highlight that security is not just about companies and public brands, that it also individuals, they need to protect themselves. Um, I'm going to give the example, one of the biggest names in pop culture, Taylor Swift, is spending about 30 million US dollars on security, which includes cybersecurity protection. And these are just numbers from her latest uh, era store. She's a huge advocate of cybersecurity and brings a lot of awareness to others. So Ralph, you don't need to be a celebrity, of course, to protect yourself. Why should individuals continue to realize that cybersecurity prevention also applies to them and not just companies? I mean, that's that's really the core of the issue is that, first of all, companies are just individuals at the end of the day. Uh, so is governments. They're just people. And so at the end of the day, we are all consumers first. Uh, and then this, these, these other words that you can put on that we're employees or that we are government, uh, you know, uh, workers in some way. Um, the, the bottom line is that we have, uh, unfortunately, tended to look at this issue of security as this is someone else's problem. As an individual, this is, you know, whoever my Internet service provider is or Apple or you know, name it, right? Uh, you try to put this issue on, hey, it's your fault that I got hacked. And mm -hmm. to be honest, the majority of the hacks, it's not their fault. It's actually your fault uh, mm -hmm. because the most effective uh, means that people are getting hacked are not because of the technology. The technology is actually being used against them, right? Um, in a way that makes them uh, trust what they're seeing. So, I think, you know, it, it, when it comes to the individuals, I think there, there are tools out there for, for people. It's just a, a lot of people don't tend to care it's, until something happens. And then when mm -hmm. something happens, then they care, right? Um, and, and that caring goes on for a little while, right? Until it goes away again, unless something else happens, right? Uh, and, and that's unfortunate, but that's the psychology of cybersecurity, right? When it comes to the individual's privacy. And you know, I recently did a TED Talk, um, actually last year, and really try to focus on the word privacy because I found it really interesting that that word is actually something that we have never really defined. And you can go and look and, you know, look at the definition of what you think privacy is, but it's a very great term, right? It's really something you as an individual define. I might be okay with sharing my, uh, my, my phone number. You know, I share it in a card. Right. I give people my information. I, def I define what I put in that information that I give people. Right. And so think of that and think of all of the things you're giving information to and you're connected to. Um, have you actually even ha gone through that process in your head? Have you even thought to, to think of things that way and go, well, what would I share and what wouldn't I share? Right. And we obviously share a lot without actually thinking. Um, and so it tends to be our fault to, to really not define privacy for ourselves as an individual uh, and then you know use the tools and, and whatever for for you to uh, to support that policy you've sort of set up in your in your head for example most hackers and we will tell you this most techies um, are, are going to be uh, especially those in cybersecurity world they're going to be using a whole bunch of tools that most of you would 
never know about, right? Um, because they know, right? Um, they've gone down that rabbit hole, but that's because they started with the idea of, okay, I want to think about what happens if somebody steals my backpack and my laptop is in there. And they've gone through that thought and gone, okay, do I have, what, what do I need to have to make sure no one can read what's on my laptop? Do I have full disk encryption turned on? Pretty much all operating systems now will allow you to click one thing and, and turn that on, but do most people turn it on? No, right? So uh, it's really a matter of, of, of people wanting to deal with this issue. And I think, like I said, the, the scary part is that, as we call it security, you know, uh, and you know my analogy, and the security guy at the door of a club, nobody wants to go through that. They just want to go through the side door and get into the party. So <laughs> I think we need to sort of change uh, the narrative a bit to real, you know, to to get people to realize this is really a matter of your safety, your yeah. your actual yeah. physical safety, not your just not your digital safety. No, it, it immediately translates to your physical safety if you're not careful. Absolutely. Yeah, it's we the friction. Big summary. Give me in 30 seconds, who is doing it right? I'm going to start it by saying Cisco is doing it right as a role model. Who in security is doing it right this year? Um, I'm I'm going to have to go with Cisco as well. I mean, they're, they're still on their journey. So security has been something that the company has sort of dabbled in over the years, but now they're, they're getting serious. I mean, that that twenty six billion dollar acquisition of Splunk brings uh, security and observability capabilities uh, to Cisco. They're they're already integrating that. Um, they're creating what I like to call business de risk applications, um, and it's all about improving visibility and and discovering those those gaps in security on the network. And um, they're they're well on their way. I I you know I would also point to Fortinet. I think they've done a masterful job getting back to the whole notion of integrating security and networking together. They have uh, what they call 40 OS, which is a networking and security fabric um, that allows uh, its customers to deploy consistent policies across a number of different devices and domains and, and that sort of thing. So uh, those are certainly companies to watch. I'll also put in a final gratuitous plug for my RSA Forbes article that I posted. Um, I did speak about a couple of startups to watch as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Will. And thank you, Ralph. Thank you both for your time today. There you have it, everyone. More insights from what's happening in 2024. Make sure you follow Will and Ralph for more insights. The links will be on the description. Anytime I jump on a call with these two guys, I think I require at least three or four hours. There is never enough time, but we will have more <laughs> follow-ups uh, follow in the future. So I'm Elise Quevedo. Until next time, see you guys. <laughs>